Elizabeth Barrett Browning was a major Victorian poet. Her work was both popular and critically acclaimed. In fact, when Wordsworth died in 1850, many people thought that the Elizabeth Barrett Browning should be named Poet Laureate. Um, at the time, though, she was living in Italy, and so the honor went to Tennyson. But despite her literary success, and she had great literary success, um, she had a sad life. Now, you'll notice that I don't usually spend a lot of time talking about authors' lives. I'm much more interested in their works, and it also disturbs me the way that some people use biographical criticism in reductive ways, denying the power of the literary imagination and tracing every little aspect of the work to something in the biography. I think that's unfair to the writers. Female writers have often suffered more from this than male writers. They get more attention to their lives than they do to their works, but both male and female writers have suffered. In this case, though, Elizabeth Browning's biography is important for one of the works that you're reading, which is the sonnets from the Portuguese, so I do want to tell you a little about it. It's also one of the most romantic, small r, romantic stories in literary studies. Elizabeth Barrett was a happy little girl. She was highly intelligent, and her father encouraged her literary ambitions. By following along with her brother's lessons, she acquired an excellent education, including Latin and Greek, which women usually didn't learn. When she was 14 in 1820, her father had an epic poem that she had written, The Battle of Marathon, privately printed, showing his support and appreciation for her talent. But her happiness didn't last. Um, she, she suffered a serious illness the very next year. Uh, her mother died. The family experienced financial losses and was forced to move to a smaller house, eventually settling here at 50 Wimpole Street in London. Through it all, though, she continued to write, to correspond with other writers, and to publish. But then, in 1837, she burst a blood vessel which affected her lungs, and she became an invalid, seldom able to leave the house in London where her family had settled. Her relationship with her father was also problematic. They were very close. Uh, he prayed with her every night. He talked with her. Uh, he delighted in her success. But he was also very jealous of the affections of all his children, Elizabeth included. Whenever a son or daughter married, he cut them off from the family, and he maintained a tight control over his household. Her health was also a constant struggle. In 1840, her doctor insisted that she spend time at the seaside to improve her health. Um, by the way, uh, I want a referral to this doctor. My doctor is always saying I should, oh, I don't know, get more exercise, use less salt, uh, eat more vegetables. Uh, my doctor, she never recommends seaside holidays or even winters abroad to improve my health. But Elizabeth Barrett Browning's doctor, sorry, Elizabeth Barrett's doctor, was clearly uh, a much better doctor. Well, she begged her father uh, not only to let her go to the seaside, but to let her favorite brother, Edward, she called him Bro, go with her to Torquay. This is the Victorian seaside resort of Torquay. Her father finally gave in, and they went, and Bro drowned in a boating accident. Elizabeth was overcome with grief and guilt, and still suffering in ill, Ill health. Back in London, writing in her darkened room, she struggled with depression, but she kept writing. Uh, this is the period when she wrote The Cry of the Children, which had a significant public impact on child labor laws. Years passed in this way. And then one day, she receives a letter from a younger, less well-known poet, but one whose work she had read, Robert Browning. January 10th, 1845, New Cross, Hatcham, Surrey. I love your verses with all my heart, my dear Miss Barrett, and this is no off-hand complimentary letter that I shall write. Whatever else, no prompt matter of course recognition of your genius, and there are graceful and natural end of the thing. 
since the day last week when i first read your poems i quite laugh to remember how i've been turning again in my mind what i should be able to tell you of their effect upon me for the first in the first blush of delight i thought i would this once get out of my habit of purely passive enjoyment when i do really enjoy and thoroughly justify my admiration perhaps even as a loyal fellow craftsman should try and find fault and do some little good to be proud of hereafter but nothing comes of it all so into me has it gone and part of me has it become this great living poetry of yours not a flower of which but took root and grew i do as i say love these books with all my heart and i love you too this began one of the best known best documented courtships in literary history uh, the courtship was carried on through letters, which we still have, which you can read online. Uh, Robert Browning soon began asking to come and see her in person, and she kept resisting. She knew her father wouldn't approve, and she thought that as an invalid, she was not a good match for this energetic young poet. But finally she gave in, and he began to visit her. In the meantime, unbeknownst to Robert, she was writing sonnets about their relationship. The crisis came when the doctor told her she probably wouldn't survive another winter in England and advised her to go to Italy for her health, and her father refused to take her. But when Robert heard, he wanted to take her immediately. It was clear then who really loved her, and she agreed to marry Robert Browning. They had a secret wedding, and the next day they eloped to Italy, settling in Florence in Casa Guidi, and her father refused to see her again. But Robert and Elizabeth lived very happily at Casa Guidi, both writing great poetry. She recovered much, though not all, of her health and vitality, and almost miraculously, at the age of 43, gave birth to a son, uh, nicknamed Penn Browning, uh, appropriate for the son of two poets. On the day their son was born, she presented Robert with a manuscript, the sonnets that she had written during their courtship. He was blown away, and he insisted that they were some of the greatest sonnets in the English language and that they had to be published. So the next year, she published them under the slightly misleading title Sonnets from the Portuguese, which suggested that they were translations of someone else's sonnets. But it was also an in-joke, because Browning's pet name for her was My Little Portuguese, because she had dark hair and dark coloring. Uh, everyone quickly realized, though, the biographical content, and these sonnets have become some of the most famous in English literature. You're going to read a selection of these sonnets, but I just want to read the first sonnet with you, which expresses her feelings when Browning brought love into her life. I thought once how Theocritus had sung of the sweet years the dear and wished-for years, who each one in a gracious hand appears to bear a gift for mortals, old or young. And, as I mused it in his antique tongue, I saw in gradual vision through my tears the sweet, sad years, the melancholy years, those of my own life, who by turns had flung a shadow across me. Straightway I was where so weeping, how a mystic shape did move behind me, and drew me backward by the hair, and a voice said in mastery while I strove, Guess now who holds thee. Death, I said. But there the silver answer rang, Not death, but love. These are Italian sonnets. Uh, so you see the tight rhymes, A, B, B, A, sung, years appears, young, tongue, Tears, years flung, right? A B B A A B B B A in the octave. Um, in the octave, her years had not given her gifts, as the ancient Greek writer had said, but each one pa um, pa flung, each one cast a new shadow across her. The turn comes in the middle of the eighth line when the shape appears and grabs her by the hair, and she thinks. It must be death. The only big change she can imagine in her sad life is her own death. But it's not death come to change her life. 
it's love. And the rest of the sonnets take on new and deeper meaning when you can think about Elizabeth Barrett's own life as a poet and as a woman, rescued from guilt and from grief by Robert Browning's love.